Okay, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak here today. Uh, my name is Ari Akimi. I'm a kidney surgeon at Sloan Kettering. I work with James Shea, who's a medical oncologist, MD, PhD, and we study kidney cancer. Um, and I'm going to talk about some of our work that we've done in kidney cancer post hoc after the paper came out, essentially. So we formed what's called what we call a clinical TCGA, and this is essentially focused on uh, um, questions that matter to clinicians um, using genomic data. So why, is this, why does this matter and why is this relevant and why should we all th be thinking about this? So clinical information collected at the time of TCGA is often very limited, as we just heard in, in terms of gastric cancer, but in, in many cancer types it's the same way. Um, the data is often not reviewed in advance by disease experts, focusing on the nuanced questions that matter to that specific cancer type. Cancer-specific information is often not collected. In the case of kidney cancer, only about 70 percent of the patients die from disease, and that matters in terms of when you're predicting biomarkers, whether a patient died from cancer or not. And other factors such as risk factors, post-treatment surgical treatment information, and detailed metastatic information is, all, is also lacking. So to address this, we went back to uh, the source sites, about 80 percent in the case of clear cell renal cell carcinoma, and uh, collected data from uh, disease experts. These are medical oncologists and surgeons and pathologists from the different uh, institutions that we worked with. And um, in, in, in the case of Sloan Kettering, where I work, um, we have a very close collaboration with Chris Sanders and the computational biology group there. And Anders Jacobs, in, in particular, helped with some of these projects that I'm going to talk about. But essentially, we collected uh, additional information on about 82 percent of TCGA, and this took about uh, a year to collect all this data. And we uh, also got detailed treatment information, which I'll very briefly talk about. Um, so what kind of data did we collect? We, we looked at um, some data that was already collected, but we actually drilled down and found that there were a lot of holes in that data, such as prior cancer history, family history. We looked at comorbidities. I'm going to talk a little bit about BMI uh, in a second. Uh, we also collected certain lab values that were lacking. We also collected whether the patients were symptomatic presentation, which matters in particular for kidney cancer. And then in terms of metastatic disease, which I'll talk about uh, toward the end of my talk, uh, we looked at whether they were present at time of surgery, the location, and the timing of metastases, which matters a, a tremendous amount in my disease, in kidney cancer, because patients with early metastatic disease do much more poorly than those that develop solitary sites of metastases later on. And then, obviously, we collected systemat uh, systemic therapy in terms of the time and indications and, and, and the responses. So uh, these were the kinds of data that we collected ad uh, ad additional. So we collected stuff like BMI, which was, uh, which was not there, obviously, smoking status, systematic treatment, whether they received treatment preoperatively, which should not have happened, although 1.5% uh, actually received treatment beforehand, um, and um, other factors that I think will be relevant down the road. So I'm going to talk two stories quickly in this talk, um, and I'm going to show you how you can use this TCJ type of data to answer specific questions. So the first part, we'll be talking about early, uh, risk factors for developing disease, and the second part, we'll be talking about metastatic disease. So what do we know in terms of kidney cancer, in terms of epidemiologic risk factors? There are established risk factors um, such as cigarette smoking, body weight, and hypertension. Now these are m relatively mild uh, associations, nothing like smoking and bladder or lung cancer. However, they're definitely well-established and well-known risk factors. The interesting thing about BMI in particular is that this is a forest plot showing meta-analysis that while BMI is known to be a risk factor for developing kidney cancer, uh, it has also been shown to be protective. So the patients that have higher body mass index at the time of surgery have better cancer-specific survival outcomes. So in order to answer this question, we first looked at our surgical database of about 2,000 patients. And we wanted to control for obvious confounding factors that could potentially explain why patients that are heavier do better. So we looked at fa factors like symptoms of presentation, whether these patients had other comorbidities that might bring them to the doctor and get screened earlier. We looked at tumor size, which could be a factor at, at, you know, so if you would be screened early, you might have smaller tumors. And then in order to kind of come up with a plausible hypothesis for why we see this, we then looked at about 126 patients from the early CTCG, now we have 340, but at the time we did this, we just focused on the Sloan Kettering ones, which was 126 patients. So these are uh, just a big table, but basically the red box outlines the fact that patients that are more obese are more likely to have lower stage tumors and lower grade tumors. And when you control for uh, factors in multivariate analysis, you see that these, uh, that, that higher, body, higher body mass index um, 
uh, will is associated with with uh, better outcomes. When you control for stage and grade, this does go away statistically. Although the hazard ratios are in the effect that you would expect the, in the in the relative. Um, relationship that you would expect. Now, and again, this is not surprising because I've shown you that BMI is so strongly correlated with lower stage disease. And this is looking at poor nutritional status. So even, so patients that have, that are more obese, uh, they might have uh, poor nutrition. So we controlled for levels of albumin in the serum and we showed that this BMI is an independent predictor. So I think, uh, hopefully I've convinced you that BMI itself is associated with, with more favorable disease risk. So in order to kind of explore this from a genomic standpoint, we looked at 126 patients, and we looked at, because this is a TCJ, we had a wealth of information. We looked at mutations, copy number now, uh, events, uh, promoter methylation, and mRNA expression, which is where the money was for this analysis. And we performed pathway analysis of genes differentially expressed in the obese versus the normal weight cohorts. And then we just recently published this in JNCI. These are some of the figures from this, uh, from this uh, paper. Where we showed essentially that there were no differences in terms of overall mutation status, the number of mutations, including not silent versus non-silent. We looked at the top 15 or so uh, genes that were mutated. There was really no difference uh, in any of the uh, OB, uh, BMI cohorts. Um, and the same thing for copy number analysis and methylation. Essentially, no differences between the different cohorts that would have any insight into the differences in survival based on that. However, when we did look at mRNA expression, we saw some pretty interesting findings. So this is the top ranked genes in terms of overexpression and underexpression um, using um, uh, log rank. And um, we immediately see uh, some genes that were uh, in the uh, fatty acid metabolism and beta oxidation rich pathway. So of, of ranked eight and 12 of these were, were fatty acid synthesis genes, fatty acid beta oxidation genes, fatty, uh, fatty acid metabolic process. So we clearly see immediately that there's a, there's a signal related to fatty acid synthesis. And actually, um, looking uh, at the downregulated genes, uh, we found something very striking that uh, ob more obese patients had downregulations of FASN. And FASN is one of the hi highlighted metabolic uh, pathways in kidney cancer. It was one of the primary figures in the Nature paper showing that, high, that lower FASN levels are associated with, with poor outcome. And indeed, if you would stratify patients both our cohort and then the uh, entire remaining TCGA cohort by FASN levels, you could see that they had strikingly different levels of survival. And uh, we know that FASN's role in neoplastic lipogenesis is well characterized. It allows for de novo lipid synthesis and essentially allows the cells to hijack the normal uh, uh, endogenous lipid um, metabolism, which you usually get from diet, to uh, promote cell survival. So FASN has been known to be upregulated in, um, uh, in, in RCC before, and uh, indeed that lower expression of FASN among obese colorectal patients uh, was seen in other cancer types. So essentially, the model that we have here now is that higher, uh, higher levels of FASN, upregulation of FASN, essentially is associated with better survival, um, sorry, worse survival, and the obese patients downregulate this pathway. And we also indeed saw the upregulation uh, up and downregulation of uh, ACC and the, both in the, and the mRNA and protein level. So essentially, we created a model that looked at genomic data coupled with epidemiologic data to come up with a plausible mechanism for why we see this. And it's not surprising entirely that we saw the effect in the mRNA expression, which would 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 more postulate that there's an interaction between um, uh, obesity and the, and, the, and the milieu of the tumor as opposed to an inherent uh, different biology within these tumors. So the last part, I would just briefly like to talk about some of our prelim data in terms of metastatic disease, just really highlighting what we've been collecting and just our initial first pass at some of the analysis, which is just really in its infancy. So what did we collect here? So we looked at both the number and the timing of metastatic cases. So we did find that about 123 patients within the TCGA cohort had metastatic disease, but as you can see, that this timing of metastatic disease uh, was, was variable. So 75% of patients pre presented with metastatic disease, so that means that they had evidence of metastatic disease at the time of surgery, so the samples that were submitted were in the setting of metastatic disease already. Another uh, few patients developed within the first three months, and we considered that a presentation because they were probably missed initially. And then within the first year, about 17, uh, developed metastatic disease, and then as you can see, there's a whole long list of patients that developed disease at a later point of time. We also collected uh, sites of metastases. So very interestingly, in kidney cancer, uh, unfortunately, some tumors will spread to the brain, and this is a very troubling uh, sign when this happens. The patients are usually um, in very bad shape. 
But we often don't know, and, and standard MRIs of the brain are not uh, what we do typically for patients unless they're having symptoms. So the questions are whether we can start seeing signals of this in the uh, primary tumor setting. And again, the purpose of this is really just to show the data that we've collected so far and talk about what we're going to be doing downstream. In terms of treatment information, you can see that we this took us quite a bit of time, but we had medical oncology fellows or um, uh, uh, physicians at different hospitals uh, getting detailed treatment data on these patients. So we have all this information now, and we're just starting to go through this data to see if we can correlate treatment responses with uh, underlying genomic uh, alterations in the tumors. And then we started, look, we started to look at differences now focusing on high-risk tumors. So this is, a, this is an analysis that Anders did. Uh, again, this is its first pass, but we've looked at stage three versus stage four. So why are some advanced stage, why do some advanced stage tumors metastasize and some don't? And now we have this information, we're taking clinical information, we're taking genomic information, and we're looking at what separates out these tumors. They both have high-risk features, yet some metastasize and some don't. And these are kind of the types of analysis that we're seeing with this. Uh, and then we're also focusing on what separates out the tumors themselves within the metastatic cohort. So can do tumors that metastasize early versus ones that metastasize later have different underlying profiles? And just looking at PCA plus, we start seeing some differences by methylation alone, although this is, again, this is just very preliminary data. So the, um, and obviously new algorithms that are out there, like what uh, Roel has put out from um, MD Anderson, looking at the ways of deconvoluting tumors, I think this will be a very intriguing data set to look at this. As we know that certain tumors have uh, inherent immune responses that are, pro that, that are detectable with using RNA-seq methods. So potentially we can look at the impact of the immune response on early versus late, later metastatic diseases, perhaps using that as a signature to determine whether a patient should be put on a different surveillance protocol or an adjuvant trial based on the underlying um, features within that tumor. So in conclusions, the, the goal of a CTCGA is can really provide powerful insights into both clinical and epidemiologic phenomena that are very relevant. The rich genomic information can serve as discovery cohorts for targeted validations in much larger clinical cohorts, which is obviously what you need to answer these types of questions. But I think if we can really maximize the value of the TCGA, we can, we can start answering these questions. And, and I think this, this work also highlights collaborative infrastructures that are critical to make this kind of significant advances. Thank you very much. So, um, so at the first part, you highlight a model between BMI and the molecular model. I just wonder, you mind which one is the cause, which one is the effect? Is it BMI or its molecular change, the causal effect effect? Right. No, that, I mean, that's an excellent question. Um, and I think, I think that remains to be seen. I would probably argue that BMI is the cause in this case, but um, I think that's, you know, those are kind of the, the models that we we're trying to create now in the lab. Great talk. I uh, have two comments and a question. The first comment is that being that I'm on the higher end of the BMI, it's good to know that there's some advantages to it. Uh, not many, but at least kidney should not be one of my problems. Uh, the other one is that the clinical data that is in TCGA, the forms are extensive. Right. And they have been put together by mostly clinicians that were part of the disease working group. So if there's uh, any factor that is not there, uh, we can add them. Right. Um, the question is, why don't we have more follow-up is because the entities that provided the samples have not provided additional follow-up. Right. TCGA had payments for a single follow-up, but we never closed the door. Okay, so people can continue to put the follow-up in. And so the, my question in specific is, is your group willing to put all that data that you have accrued into the TCGA clinical site so everybody can use it? Absolutely. I mean, we were uh, just finishing curating the, um, the uh, follow-up data, uh, the treatment-related data, and then, yeah, we plan on uploading all of that data. And specifically, the cancer-specific survival data, I think, is very relevant because, like I said, in, at least in kidney, 30 percent of the patients were dying from other causes. So that's very relevant when you're trying to come up with markers, et cetera. And, and, and absolutely. And this is basically a message to everybody that has any clinical data. We have the door open. You can continue putting clinical data as long as you want until you're tired of typing. <laughs> yes. Okay? I think that's a great point. Thank you very much.
Sorry, I'd like to follow up on the, on the, the consortium we try to build. That basically is really, really open access. And the other issue is we think this is a very good opportunity to do it because kidney cancer is all targeted therapies, mTOR inhibitors, or antiangiogenic therapy. That's why we think we can actually attain some insight from it instead of just the most of the tr cancer are treated with chemotherapy. It's a little bit more messy that way. That's why we hope that we can accomplish something. Thank you. Okay, the next speaker is uh, David Wheeler from Baylor College of Medicine. He'll talk about the multi-center mutation calling in TCGA. David. 